I'm going to talk a little bit as the president of Bell Labs, so I have two jobs. I'm CTO for Nokia, so I sort of chart the course for the company uh, on a good day. Uh, and then uh, we invent that future in Bell Labs. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of the Bell Labs view of this future, because it's an important time. There is a great amount of innovation and potential in 5G, but I fear we're getting it wrong. As an industry, we're focusing a little too much on the consumer segment, and I want to argue that that's not where the new value creation is going to be. Consumers will benefit from 5G, as all the previous talkers uh, have, have indicated, including the great talk from Cristiano, but I want to actually focus on the imperative we see, which is a bit more towards that sort of industrial revolution side. So I'm going to go through a little tour of how we see the future, and hopefully you'll find it uh, an interesting story. The role of Bell Labs, by the way, people sometimes are confused. Uh, in the 80s, maybe it was a bit academic. Uh, I'll agree with that, but everything before that and after that was always focused on solving industrial problems. Communications problems, networking problems, all the things we invented, all the Nobel Prizes we won were actually going in search of solving real world problems. We just solved really hard problems, a lot of hard problems in 5G, and in solving those problems we won prizes. We won our ninth Nobel Prize this year, so we seem to still be good at that. But it's never for the sake of the prize. The prize is an accident. I think we're the most accidentally lucky organization in history. The goal is always to solve a real world problem. And so I'm going to talk about how we see the world. So this is actually uh, something I began thinking about a little bit. I was at a World Economic Forum event, and this point was made by an economist. The problem we have currently in our industry is that value creation and value extraction are not uh, synergistic or symbiotic. They, they have become separated in our industry, where the value extraction has largely gone into very advanced devices and web systems and cloud systems, and actually the value creation is in those things, but also in the networking layer. And that dichotomy has actually caused a lot of friction and turmoil in our industry. I'm going to argue that isn't going to change unless we change what we focus on. And we've got to focus on new value creation segments, which I'm going to argue are industrial. So here's actually uh, sort of the proof point of this is on the left here, as you look at it, is operator growth. There's obviously a bit of a jump for SoftBank, but pretty much everything else in revenue growth is stuck around 1% of revenue growth. Compare it to the platform companies, whether they're Chinese or American, uh, very significantly higher growth, 4 or 5% and, and, and continuously or exponentially growing. Value being extracted, value being created, but they are not coming together. How are we going to fix this? We're going to fix it by recognizing we're about to undergo a shift. And this is probably the most important slide. It sort of is our historical perspective. One of the advantages of being in Bell Labs is we have 90 years of looking at things intelligently. Uh, so we sort of accumulate a perspective. And I'm going to show you what the answer is at the end. The gap isn't I don't know. The gap is I'm going to propose something. So the way to look at this is the things in blue are the things that have preeminent value in each of the decades. Things in white got devalued. In the first era, which I call the supercomputing era, the things that had value were complex hardware, big mainframes, and the OSs that ran those mainframes, which were time-slicing jobs. There wasn't really a network you were aware of. There was no human-machine interface. It was a punch card reader or even an elementary terminal that you typed at. That was the value system in the 80s. Shift to the 90s, Moore's Law takes that computing power, puts it in a PC, so the whole world changes. The human machine interface matters because now it's regular humans, not just computer science students, interacting with that device. The OS matters, but in a completely different way. It's now an OS that manages user jobs for the individual user. And those applications, this is going to be important. What were the killer applications? Was it gaming? Was it video? It was office applications. It was actually companies like WordPerfect and Lotus Notes and all those. Office applications drove that transition. You took work home. And I'm going to come back to that point. In parallel, think of those first two as the information era. In parallel was the mobile telephony transition. Remember, ICT is information and communications. This is the communications era. Telecom networks actually came to the fore here. This is the era of the feature phone. In the feature phone era, which is when Nokia did extremely well, Hardware mattered because it was hard to compress into a small form factor and make it mobile. OSs didn't matter. And that was actually one of the reasons why Nokia struggled, is that it didn't invest in OSs. Right? Whereas Apple, Samsung, Android ecosystem clearly did. 
network began to matter. You actually bought mobile ne uh, telephony service and telecom services were in the bubble era, one of the things that everyone thought would dominate the future. What did we miss? We missed I and C coming together. PCs and C, communications technology, which is what Apple absolutely saw, that in fact what they created was a mobile computer. And that's the era that we missed as an industry. And look how the value changed in that era. Human machine interface had to be super cool because users were inter interfacing with it. Hardware was still hard. You had to pack a lot into a small form factor and very clever touch screens. The OS mattered. Apps now were not enterprise apps. They were now consumer apps and an ecosystem of those. Uh, the network got relatively devalued. This is my value extraction leaching out of network. And web and cloud systems came up. And if you look at that, it's sort of a merging of the I and C eras. You can see exactly what happened. What should have happened is the network got valued. But in fact, in these new ecosystem shifts, not everyone wins. OK, and so there weren't winners in the networking there. So operators suffered. Vendors to operators suffered somewhat. Chipset suppliers to vendors to operators suffered somewhat. So what's going to change? I will argue if we focus on consumer broadband, nothing. It'll look like this. But here's the shift. And Cristiano alluded to this. I think he did a nice job. The shift is it won't be just about smart devices. There will be smart devices. I think the foldable devices actually are super cool. So well done on those. But those will be in the consumer segment. In the industrial segment, it's such a different set of devices that are going to be much more intuitive, immersive, connected to you, worn by you, ingested by you. And those devices are going to have the property of having a human machine interface that is simple. Hardware will be simple, but they'll be intuitive. There will be no meaningful OS in those devices. So the thing that was the anchor of the smartphone era, I would argue OSs and app ecosystems, disappears. That OS becomes an AI system in the cloud. To Cristiano's point, if that AI system in the cloud is the thing you're interacting with, you better have a damn good network. And that's the 5G networking role. That's the revolution, is it's a permanently always-on, ultra-reliable, ultra-available, low-latency, high-performance, everywhere network. And that doesn't sound like 4G. So look at that value system. New cool devices, simpler devices, no OS. Hardware's hard, but it's simple. I mean, it's mostly a sensor and a radio, you can argue. No apps. I don't see apps, I see an AI assistant that is just providing services to me. That goes away. Network matters, edge cloud matters, AI matters. New value system. We can take it because we actually have an advantage here. So let's recognize that advantage. It's not on the device side. Device companies will do device things. They'll do well. It's not on OS side. Maybe the web players will still own some OSs, but the OSs don't matter. What, and, and in fact, the, uh, the web scale company's only advantage, I would argue, is in the, uh, the AI systems. We have edge cloud because it's embedded in the network. We have network. We've got sort of two of the value systems here. And I'm going to argue that when you have edge cloud, you actually have the AI system because that AI system has to be local running in the edge cloud. You also have the security layer because those devices have to be secured in the edge cloud. So when you own edge cloud and network, you own AI, you own security, and maybe own some of the applications as well. So that's the shift. It's not the same world. So let's keep going on this. So I'm going to argue that it's actually time to rebalance or harmonize value creation and value extraction. And this always happens. Systems that are out of whack always rebalance over time because there's a reaction to that imbalance. And that's what's going to happen. I'm going to sort of show you a little bit more on that topic. I'm going to show you also how I see humans interacting with this, because it's not just about machines in isolation. It's humans and machines interacting. But let's just sort of ground ourselves a little bit on how big a change this is. You can argue that humans uh, would change how they interact with digital things. Today, it's mostly consumer type applications, smartphone based, interacting with centralized cloud architectures because most humans actually can't perceive latencies lower than 100 milliseconds. That's when I talk and speak to you, you're perceiving in about 100 milliseconds. It's all about e-commerce and social and best effort. We shift to industrial internet or industrial human experiences. It's multitudes of things. Edge clouds, why? because I need real-time interaction. And real-time now is updates that actually my brain can perceive faster than I can talk. Or a machine can get an update faster than a human can process. And that's milliseconds. In milliseconds, it's very simple. This is sort of the Bell Labs way of thinking. How far can light travel in one millisecond? Who wants to guess? Round trip time, about 100 kilometers. So if I need to answer you from my AI system or AR system, 
within one millisecond, you cannot be further away from me than 100 kilometers. So suddenly global infrastructure, 10,000 kilometers away web platforms, has to move within 100 kilometers. So the speed of light has actually told us the future. It's great to rely on physics, because you don't have to make any argument about product or whatever. You simply say the future is highly distributed cloud systems. We also know from all the previous talk, highly distributed radio systems, because that's the only way I get hypercapacity in the bearer. So think of it as cloud is the control plane, radio is the bearer. I shift both massively to the edge. And then, of course, it's about what I call augmented intelligence platforms, not applications, uh, and high performance networking. One other way I like to look at this, if we think about that industrial segment, is this. This helps some people think about how, what a revolution it could be and how we're going to go about addressing this revolution. It's actually about a collision of ICT and OT. ICT has done very well as an ecosystem. That's what we've built. But it hasn't collided with OT, OT being operations technology. That's the stuff that runs the physical world. Factories, logistics, warehousing, transportation infrastructure, cities is operations technology. And it actually uses relatively little ICT. It tends to use proprietary systems based on bespoke technologies, bespoke radio technologies, yet often derived from Ethernet specs, but they're things called Profinet is one of their protocols, which is a derivative. They generally use wires rather than wireless. Uh, they generally don't innovate very much. It's st systems that have remained stable for 30 years. They're closed systems, uh, et cetera. Now, the thing that they're much better at, which is make, make it, makes it a challenge, is we think carrier grade is good. But carrier grade is only 99.8% good. That's the call drop rate in a, in a mobile network. 99.8, so it's 0.2% is a super good mobile network. Mission critical is six nines. So suddenly we've got to build a network that, based on ICT technologies, the things we build, is six nines reliable. And we're going to do that by using all the radio layers an ultra low latency, a multiple paths through those networks to highly reliable, scalable cores, which actually can self heal. And we've got a dynamically network slice to support the SLAs required. These are the requirements. It's OT and ICT colliding that are actually driving those release 16 and release 17 requirements. How much money? So I'm going to talk a little bit about money. So Bell Labs Consulting is a function I own. Its job is just to think about the future uh, and also predict the future of it. We forecast by actually building this new infrastructure by a combination of analytics, security, hosting services, and new network connectivity. There is two billion of new revenue, uh, sorry, two trillion of new revenue in our industry. Our industry is about one trillion as a, an industry. So this could be double or triple uh, the amount of, of revenue. So this is credible. The cloud business, the AWS public cloud business, et cetera, is about half a trillion today. That's come to half a trillion from nowhere in, in 10 years. I'm arguing that in 10 years, we have the potential to double or triple the size of our industry if we focus on the right segments, edge cloud, high performance networking, and associated AI systems and services. So my, my sort of core point is going to be this. We, are, we can extract new value, but massively increasing human productivity by automation of industrial or physical systems tightly coupled to the human experience. New value architecture, massively distributed radios and cloud, and new value systems, these are the ones that augment humans. The only way you, you, you sort of improve productivity is in the end interfacing to a human whose life becomes better or, or lives more efficiently because that system runs more efficiently helping that human. So never think that the human isn't part of this equation. So I'm just going to end here. We have to push the limits. You all know this. But I'm going to just say the way I think about 5G is a nine-dimensional evolution. And here it is. You can think we've played capacity games so far in wireless networks. In fact, of the three dimensions of capacity, which are spectrum efficiency and space, we really only played two of them, which is we sort of ignored the spatial dimension, which was small cells. It never really happened. Wi-Fi happened more than small cells. Small cells remains a business for us, but not as big as macro by any stretch of the imagination. So we played spectrum and spectral efficiency games. Now we're going to go to space. When we go to space, we open up new spectrum bands, millimeter wave. Uh, when we need spectral efficiency, we'll do massive MIMO, because technology is advanced that I can do more in that dimension. But even beyond that uh, is a latency and reliability dimension. That's why it's a nine-dimensional evolution. Three in capacity, three in reliability, three in latency. That's a human revolution. That's a networking revolution, the like of which we have never seen. So with that, I'm going to just wrap up on a spectrum point. 
Our industry has to be much more flexible on spectrum. We kill ourselves, and what I want to show here is by an obsession with lic licensed spectrum. It has been the anchor of our industry, but it is also the millstone around our neck, because if you look at the business models it relates to, it only gives rise to sort of local national networks because of the way licensed spectrum is bought and sold at prices that are very high. There are other business models, and the reason I blur them all over on the right is you can blur all those spectrum bands in 5G. I can use shared spectrum, unlicensed, licensed, and I can address all the different local global networking value systems that I have not been able to address because we overemphasize license spectrum. 5G removes that in release 16. So let's just be aware of that. Let's give up our bigotry and actually go for a multi-spectrum, any spectrum solution that allows us to go after industrials. Because what do industrials not want? They don't want to be beholden to one license band from one operator. They want freedom to actually deploy that multinationally in any, with the same technology, same band. So they're going to be much more uh, open to shared spectrum, any spectrum sort of uh, deployment. So in the end, this is where I end up. This is sort of our FutureX architecture, but my main point is this. The nexus of new value is the bottom part. And why? Because everything has to sit in the converged edge cloud, running over the access layer to a set of intelligent devices. All those upper layers, cognition systems, uh, the uh, programmable networks, the uh, application layer, or digital value platforms have to collapse into the edge cloud because of that latency requirement. So the whole stack moves to the edge. That's the value system our industry stands on the verge of enabling if we do this right. I'll wrap up there. Thanks very much for your time and uh, letting me speak to you today.